work has changed a lot. Um, your curiosity makes you think about now more than ever what what you're picking up and where it came from and uh, where it's been. Uh, everybody is um, on alert. We work for the public. We work for the community. Somebody has to do it and we're stepping up to do it. You're more concerned about what's in the containers, where it came from, how is it gonna affect you. We have uh, gloves, the rubber, rubber gloves, like the hospital gloves that go on top of our gloves. Um, and that's basically it. We don't wear a mask. Uh, uh, there's nothing to protect us when we open cans or open lids. Uh, we're just out in the element. We need to be able to be safe. We don't want to take anything home to our uh, families. Uh, we don't want to share uh, anything with our coworkers. Um, I'm quite sure there's more things, precaution that can be taken for the essential workers. For ourselves, uh, for the community, uh, we know our role and we go out and do it day after day. Gastroenterology is the study of diseases of the digestive tract. This includes everything from the mouth to the esophagus, the stomach, and small and large intestines, as well as the pancreas and liver. It involves treating conditions such as hepatitis, pancreatitis, reflux, ulcers, and inflammatory bowel diseases, including Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. It's also a procedure in which we can use endoscopy, a tool using scopes, to do things like reduce the chances of a colon cancer by doing screening colonoscopies. The category of oil rig workers comprises several oil rig jobs. These include petroleum engineers, who plan extraction and oversee entire drilling operations, equipment or derrick operators, who make the drill run on a daily basis, and manual laborers, who are often called roustabouts. Petroleum engineers are tasked with devising the drilling strategy for a given rig. They must have a good working knowledge of mathematics, chemistry, biology and thermodynamics. Derrick operators and other equipment operators maintain drilling equipment, prepare and operate pumps, obtain samples and inspect or repair rigs. Roustabouts assemble or repair equipment in the field. They work with their hands and with industry-specific tools to do so. They may use both hand and power tools in their work. Many roustabouts work in Texas because this is where the majority of the nation's oil fields are located. Those who work in Alaska enjoy higher salaries, however. Oil Rig Worker Education Requirements The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that petroleum engineers must have a degree in engineering and specifically in petroleum engineering whenever possible. Attending a college or university that offers a fellowship or cooperative program to gain hands-on experience is ideal. Derrick operators need only a high school diploma or a GED, but they may have additional education. Similarly, roustabouts may have a high school diploma or GED. For both of these roles, on-the-job experience in similar roles is more important than education. Working on oil rigs with no experience is not a good idea due to the highly technical and intensely physical nature of these jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that petroleum engineers earn a median annual wage of $137,720 per year, half earn more and half earn less. Derrick operators and other equipment professionals earn a salary of $48,030 on average. These wages vary greatly depending on the location of the oil rig. For example, workers in Alaska's oil fields tend to earn more than those in Texas where there are more drill sites and more laborers in the industry. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says that roustabouts can expect to earn $41,280 annually on average. 
roustabouts in Alaska tend to earn $48,370, while those in Texas fare much worse at $32,940. You see these at different festivals and events, but we're going to show you what it takes to get them there, keep them clean for you, and take them out as soon as the event is over. Pretty much I run about 5.36 until 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night, sometimes later. A full day filled with a lot of driving and a lot of moving. Okay, and the knees you're grabbing right here, okay. like this, and just slide and walk them back like that. Stuck on something or no? No. Okay. You do this by yourself? Yeah. All day. All right. <laughs> so how much does this weigh? I think it weighs about 100 pounds. Once those are in place. Oh. oh. Something dripped on me. And stocked. It's time to move on to the next site. So walk me through the process of what we're going to do here. Cleaning a toilet, pumping it out, checking the toilet paper, refilling it. What you want to do is grab it right here, and as you slide this out, lift them up off of here, like that. Is something gonna shoot out at me? No. Okay. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Get that right in. Actually, might well. And what I do is I'll take this, the hose is clean, and set it up on your shoulder like that so when it starts jerking. There's toilet paper stuck on it. They can just pour a little bit of that in there. Needs a lot. <laughs> like around or just dump nope, it in? Just dump a little bit in the water. Your riser. Yep. Okay. Not all the toilets are like that, though. And take the hose back in there and the walls and the floor. Oh, it sprayed my face. And then on to the next. And you'll notice these don't smell anything oh. like the other one did. Oh wow, you were right. Now, if somebody does drop something in it, what is the process to get that back? You suck the toilet out, and most of the times with the sucker, like a phone, it's laying on the bottom of the tank. You can stick the sucker on top of it. Oh my gosh, I found a phone! I found <laughs> Bring it out and put it on the ground right there and then shut your rotor off. My name's Captain Keith Colburn. I'm a crab fisherman. Give me some crab. I own a boat called The Wizard and you might see me on a show called Deadliest Catch. There's something about being on the water, working with and against Mother Nature. Heads up, heads up! The teamwork that goes into being on a boat keeps your heart pumping. If I was going to make a list of the qualities I'm looking for in a, a greenhorn, first of all, he's got to have common sense. Someone that's going to take the time to actually think something through, as opposed to just react. Man down, man down. Because it may be the difference between having five fingers and having three fingers. Oh, oh, oh. You need a guy that, that's willing to not blow his top, not lose his cool. <laughs> In the Bering Sea, we use about nine words total, and five of them get beeped out. Shut the f up, do your job! So, to let that roll off your back is a real good character trait. They have to be both mentally and physically tough. I've seen the biggest, burliest guys basically fold up and phew, fall apart instantly. Axel's puking! And I've seen the wiry, little scrawny guy that can work his way through the pain and the discomfort. Everybody will talk a good story on the dock, but once it gets down to game time, all of the things that go into the job will break a guy really quickly. Sewer inspector. Rats, roaches, dark passages and the occasional corpse. No, we're not talking about a day in the life of Indiana Jones. In a much less glamorous role, 
The sewer worker deals with all of this stuff and more while braving the depths of the hundreds of miles of sewers beneath our cities. After we've done our business in the bathroom, all we have to do is flush our waste goodbye, and we'll never have to see it again. But this isn't the case for the people who take care of our sewer systems. Their job entails walking and sometimes crawling through sewer tunnels to inspect for cracks, clogs and other problems. As if wading through human excrement didn't sound bad enough, some workers are also sewage divers. As you probably guessed, they have to go all out to swim through sewage to clean out clogs. In addition to the excrement, smell, and creepy crawly bugs and rats, sewer workers sometimes come across dead bodies, both animal and human. Before you write off these employees as nuts for voluntarily diving into human waste, note that, with above a high school education, they can make over $60,000 a year. Many people consider sewer inspectors noble stewards of Mother Earth because they keep our water and our streets clean. The mine extends under the Waikato River, some roadways up to 250 metres underground. Showing Craig around a shift under manager, Paul Tregawa. Come with me on my sign in. Although uh, most people do come here for the money, uh, myself included, it's not the only reason to come here. To work in a mine you have to be passionate about it. After an all-important safety briefing, it's time to be kitted out. Before you go underground, we have to tag in. You visited number one today, right? So you take your tag from there to there. I'll also grab my tag. You hang your visitor tag up here. And because it's day shift, I'll hang my tag up there. The mine starts here, we drive in under the Waikato River. The working faces are about 5 k's from the surface. How much coal would you normally get out of here in a day? In a day, we aim for about 2,000 tonnes a day for three shifts. Paul and Craig have headed to a coal face that's scheduled for future extraction. We're completely surrounded by coal. We have about 3 metres on the floor and about another 6 metres on the roof. 40 million years ago, they would have been standing in the middle of a forest or swamp. Just come up here and stay underneath the supported roof here and I'll check for gas. Carbon monoxide and methane are the dangerous gases in a mine. No CO and no CH4. If the miners were working this heading, they could proceed to start digging coal. The coal is cut at the face with a continuous miner. It's loaded onto a shuttle car, which is electrically powered with a trailing cable. It's then delivered to the nearest conveyor belt, loaded onto the air and comes to the surface. As the coal is pulled out, the roof and walls are braced using bolts. Former trainee Cameron Beverland shows Craig how it's done. So over here Craig is our air powered drill, which drills the hole. It's called a gopher. This is the drill steel. We use water to help clean the coal out as you're drilling the hole up. Once you've drilled the hole, you grab this chemical and put it right up to the back of the hole until you get your roof bolt and spin it up to the top of the hole. Wait for about 30 seconds once it's up the top. The chemical will go hard and you tighten the nut up in the roof bolt that supports the roof. How much will that put down on reinforce and all that? I think the top of my head I think it's about 30 tonne on bolt. It's a team environment. Getting on with the joker next to you is very important because you're in a very closed environment. The roadways down there are only five metres by three metres wide, so you can't have any aggro with the joker next to you because you're with him for eight hours a day. Cameron has been at Huntley for four years. What interested you about mining? The shift work appealed to me and the hours you worked, eight hour days was good for a young family, spent a lot of time with my kids and it was a different industry to what I was in and I enjoyed it once I got cracking. Do you get tired from all, all of that? It can be pretty physical at times. Um, where we're heading down the five trunk roads is quite challenging conditions and uh, bolting can be quite uh, stressful on the body. What's the best part about being an underground coal miner for you? You get to meet a whole lot of new guys. Comradeship's pretty good underground. Yeah, you learn a lot about the geology of the earth and stuff and there's a lot more to coal mining than a lot of people probably realise. There are many related specialised job careers. They include surveying, mining engineering, and mechanical and electrical trades. Promotion prospects are good, and when you've got the experience, you could end up in the control room, the nerve center of the mine. If anybody's got a problem underground, they ring here. And when you've been here 15 years, you can get Willie's job. Under Willie's watchful eye, the coal is screened, 
cleaned of stone and other contamination, then sized and loaded into bins ready for distribution. Around 40,000 tonnes of coal is mined a month, and this is the sort of machine that does it. This is one of our continuous miners right here. This is what you'd sort of be operating after your two years of training. These are your remote controls that the operator wears over his shoulders. Um, a bit like a PlayStation really. Modern mining machinery comes large, low and long. This machine is an Imco load haul dump tractor. This is Terry. Uh, Terry, uh, Terry drives this machine here. It's called a 915 Omco. Terry uses it for carting all the bolts and uh, equipment into the mine. He also uses it for carting rubbish out. Not all mining jobs are done with big machinery. We have to clean up along the conveyor belt so that the bottom rollers down here don't get clogged up and stop. If they get clogged up and stop with the belt running across the top of them, they can heat up. And because we've got all this combustible material around us, we can actually cause a fire. There's 12 kilometres of belts, so you won't run out of work. So what you're required to do is come to here and shovel out underneath those rollers and put the coal on the belt. Any questions? Can you handle that alright? Yep. Okay, I'll leave you to it. Since meeting Craig, uh, he's been quite interested in what we've been doing. He seemed to have picked up uh, the mining aspect of things. I think if uh, he gets another uh, year behind him at school and he comes and applies for a job, uh, I couldn't see any reason why I wouldn't give him one. Coal mining is not just a job for the boys. Solid Energy is an equal opportunity employer. It employs many women and has had a female mine manager and offers many interesting careers throughout its operations including engineers, environmental scientists, planners and equipment operators. Solid Energy operates seven mines in New Zealand and with increasing demand for energy the outlook for miners is good. There's a national certificate in extractive industries with an introduction and operations course. Both comprise of compulsory standards related to health and safety, hazard recognition and emergency procedures. Career progression is good with opportunity for further study towards getting a job as a coal mine deputy, an under manager and mine manager. There are many career paths available within mining and the pay is excellent. They practice an ancient art and a modern science. Embalmers take care of people who have recently died. They clean and prepare each body as directed by the family and in accord with laws concerning health and sanitation. Embalmers receive certification from the government after completing a vocational program. They need to know about biology, chemistry, and cosmetics. Often they are called upon to repair disfigurement from illness or accident. This is a career that requires physical skill and strength, sensitivity, and emotional stability. You need to be comfortable working with bodies and with chemicals. Embalmers usually work in funeral homes. In fact, some funeral directors are embalmers as well. While the work of embalmers can be considered a tribute to the dead, it also brings comfort to the living. I've got the best office in the world because I've got a permanent corner office with a constantly changing view. And you can't ask for much more than that, especially when you're driving out to places like Piha or Whangaparaa or even out to Maraitai. We go everywhere and anywhere and we see it all. It's all on hand and we go out to the jobs and we learn on the job. You're doing all of your day-to-day -day work with another plumber learning off them and being instructed by them. Best thing for us is the team aspect of it. I go to work to see my mates basically, it's that good. We try and bump into each other on the job, we do work independently as well, but when we do bump into each other it's a lot of fun and you do work well as a team. Fridays are usually taken up with a few beers after work or a barbecue, um, and we catch up on weekends every now and again. So I was very lucky to be nominated for an award and the James Douglas Medallion. I got the award for my plumbing skills 
Um, basically there were three categories. There was a drain layer, a plumber and a gas fitter. And I got the plumbing award along with uh, the two other guys that had the drain laying and the gas fitting. I do want to have a role to teach apprentices or, or move further into the industry. I've had a glimpse at the industry at the master plumbers meeting and that annual meeting really opened my eyes to the amount of people that are involved with this great industry um, and the enthusiasm that a lot of people have um, and I'd love to be involved further with that with those people to grow the industry and improve it. After the call to 911, once the cops and the coroner have gone, things must be put back in order, even when things will never, ever be the same. It's gruesome work, but someone's got to do it. When a life ends in the worst possible way in the vicinity of Maryland or Washington, D.C., it's often a cue for Louise Burkhardt to start work. Louise excels at a job few want, and even fewer could stand to do. I go out to scenes of homicides, suicides, decomposed remains, or any kind of biological incident, and clean up and restore it to the situation that it was prior to the incident occurring. The first thing we do, obviously, is we observe the situation because every situation is totally different. Today we're dealing with a suicide. Laura, sorry to meet you like this. That's okay. Keep you the lady that we're dealing with, her husband committed suicide and he had three children. Basically what I'm going to do is go in, look at everything after I see exactly what we have to deal with, and we'll go ahead and start working. Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Now Louise must grapple with the horrors that lie beyond the bedroom door. She focuses on the process. Yeah, take, go ahead with that one, take it all in. And what I'm gonna do is pull the other sheet so we can wrap it all in that. They must look closely. What seems to be a tiny stain may be masking a hidden mass of residue. What it does is it wicks through and it can be larger underneath than it is from the top surface. If we can't properly clean something, obviously we have to remove it, dispose of it as medical waste. Sometimes the crew must remove threats to health. Other times, they try to shield survivors from even more heartbreak. We take high powered lights and check and recheck and recheck to make sure that we have everything so that when the family comes in, they don't have to deal with something unexpected. We're looking for if there was any overspray of blood, any tissue, um, teeth. Um, it could be anything. Okay. There's times where you found body, actual body parts, whether it be a nose or somebody, if they shot themselves, it's their eye. That's right there. That's a piece of school. You have to search everything in the area to make sure that there isn't anything left behind. Louise has been cleaning up after death for 11 years. It's a profitable business. Lately, her son Matt has been helping his mom in the field. To support herself and her children, Louise started out working on contract with the local medical examiner's office, transporting bodies. We started having people ask us when it was a homicide or a suicide, well, could you clean this up? And to be honest with you, I didn't think I could. Um, however, I turned around and at one point I said, yeah, we'll give it a shot. Nice. And we tried it, but we still thought it would just be a little side, it was a little sideline kind of thing. We, did not expect that there was much of a need. But the market for post-mortem cleanup crews grew with surprising speed. The new niche dovetailed with a sideline of Louise's. I had another business, a regular maid service. And I have to say that if you're gonna be cleaning for a living, this is definitely more satisfying than being a maid. Amid her heavy schedule, with its inherent sadness, Louise tries to stay upbeat. 
The best part of my job is, is having people say what a difference we made. People really have gratitude for what you do. They, after they're in those situations, they realize what it would be like if they had to do it, and they're really grateful.